All right. Well, uh, let's let's pray, and we will get into the lesson tonight. Thank you for being here. Let's let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to come together around your word. I pray, Lord, that you encourage us and help us tonight as we endeavor to be better witnesses. And, Lord, that uh, you'd fill us with your spirit. You'd empty me of myself. And, Lord, that you'd just use us today for your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. If you have, our, have your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 is where we're going to start. And you want to keep your Bible handy. We're going to look at a lot of different verses today um, as, we, as we get into how to witness to a Catholic. How to witness to a Catholic is a little bit different than you would witness to anybody. In, in some regards, obviously, you share the same Christ with them, but um, it might just be a little bit different. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we're going to start with verse 1 real quick. Verse 1, we're going to read down a few verses. The Bible says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry... As we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is him to hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for, um, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ." Um, this verse obviously speaking about the gospel and the light of Christ and how important it is that we share the gospel. And I like, I, I think verse 3 is a good, good portion of scripture to remind us that if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Um, the, the reality is if we hide the gospel, if we hide the light of, of Christ within us, um, there are many people out there who are lost who are not going to see this or, or see the gospel, hear the gospel, and just may end up uh, spending eternity in the lake of fire um, because we didn't share it with them. So there's an importance for us to, to go out and share the gospel and be involved in evangelism, not just as a church, but each of us must personally be involved in evangelism. And trying to get the gospel out. Why do we do this? Because we understand that there are lost people in the world. And when we're talking specifically about Catholics today, I hope we understand that many Catholics, or probably most Catholics, are lost. There's very few that might actually uh, have trusted Christ. I, I hesitate to even say that. Uh, there's probably very many of them, the vast majority of them, are lost. Meaning they do... they. They don't have the hope of eternal salvation. They don't have eternal security. Um, they, they have no hope of salvation. There's, there's no um, uh, joyful longing to be in heaven because they don't really know whether they're going to be in heaven. Um, in, in their mindset, they have to be good enough to get to heaven. They have to work to get to heaven. We've talked about this. There's only two types of religions. There's religions that say you must do this for nirvana or heaven or uh, endless bliss or whatever it might be. And then there is the true way, which is it's done. Jesus Christ has finished the work upon the cross for salvation to be purchased. Catholics are those who believe in doing certain things to get to heaven. Um, we talked about the sacraments last week. Um, so when we think about this, for a Catholic, they are in kind of this everlasting cycle. They're doing good. They fall into disobedience in some way. They sin in some way. So they go and confess it in confession maybe once a year. They're given some sort of indulgence, some way of showing their repentance by a priest. And then they go on and it eventually repeats itself. And they continue this cycle of, of disobedience, of, of 
getting in sin, going in confession, getting their condol- uh, indulgences, working those out to show their repentance, and then wash, rinse, and repeat, okay, is what happens with the Catholics. That's what they're on. Many of them, to be honest and truthfully, uh, truthful with us, many of them probably only go to church uh, at Easter and Christmas. Uh, they don't, they're not faithful. They don't go to confession often. But if you're a devout Catholic, this, this is what you would be doing often. As soon as you realized you sinned, you would try to go and make confession as soon as possible, uh, and, and there's a reason for it, because they believe that without making confession, they cannot go to heaven, uh, and of course, they also believe in purgatory and things like that, and we talked about that last week. So let's talk about a couple ways, really, really kind of, I think, just practical today, how to witness to a Catholic. Um, let's say you're, you're out. You're knocking on doors, you, or you, you're, uh, you're at work, and someone talks to you about spiritual things, and they turn out to be a Catholic. Um, the way you ev- evangelize a Catholic is going to be a little bit different than some of the others. You know, if you were talking to an atheist, you might approach them in a different way than you would uh, a Jehovah's Witness or something like that. So how do we witness to a Catholic? Well, first thing we have to understand is we just, we just give them the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is good news. Now, they may know it. They may know Jesus died on a cross. They may know that he was buried uh, and rose again three days later. They, they may know these things, but we have to understand that they don't need to hear my opinion. They don't need to hear my thoughts on things. They need to hear the gospel. Why? Because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. That's what Romans chapter 1 tells us. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Um, We could sit there and argue forever on communion and baptism and all these different things in the papal infallibility. We could sit there and argue and argue and go back and forth about these things. But what that person that's lost there really needs is they need the gospel. They need to hear the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that is powerful enough to to, uh, defeat sin, hell, death, and the grave so that they can have eternal life. And so really the fact is this. When we talk about the gospel, the scriptures point to the answer to our biggest problem. Our biggest problem in life is that... um, our biggest problem in life is that we are all sinners. Romans 3.23 says that. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10 says, For there is none righteous, no, not one. In fact, if you read Romans 3, there's not a single person who gets away from that chapter without being sinful. Okay, um, There's no one who has not sinned. So our biggest problem is we're all sinners. And there is judgment coming for sin. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. Ezekiel tells us, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. So our biggest problem is we're all sinners, and there's judgment coming to those who sin. But the answer, of course, we know, is, is through Jesus Christ, salvation that we found that's been purchased upon the cross. You see, the wage that we deserved, death, is what Jesus took for us on the cross. And not only that, he took the weight of our sin... He took the penalty of our sin and died on a cross, a criminal's death for you and for me. And so why do I bring all this up? Because this is the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that we're all sinners, but Jesus Christ died for all sin, for all sinners, so that we can have eternal life uh, with him in heaven. And and when we're talking about the gospel, sometimes when, when we're having a conversation with someone sometimes the best thing you can do is just to share a small verse Um, even being able to open the bible and show them a simple verse can can make all the difference Um, because again they don't need to hear my thoughts they don't need to hear my opinion they need to hear the word of god because what does the bible tell us in romans 10 it says so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of god Maybe you're in a conversation with a Catholic or something like that. You might uh, bring up John 3.16 or uh, Romans 10.13. Some of these different verses about knowing for sure you're on your way to heaven. 
And so uh, we've got to understand that the scriptures are our greatest tool. They're, they're the tool that we need. Remember we talked about Batman and his, you know, his utility belt. We cannot go out witnessing and evangelizing if we don't have the word of God with us. You know, obviously you want to take a copy of it with you, but have it hidden in your heart so that you know where to go. You know places of scripture you can take people and show them uh, so that you can preach the gospel to them. Um, and, and remember that a, a Catholic, they are not scriptural people. They don't read scripture often, okay? Um, they put above scripture, they put the Pope and sacred tradition of the church and all those different things. They put that way above scripture. So they don't read. It's not like they're having devotions every day, okay? They are people that uh, they may not have ever heard the verses you say to them. They may have not heard these things, John 3, 16, or other verses. So read them the scriptures, quote the scriptures, share them, because that is what they need. They need to hear the gospel. Isaiah 55 says this, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and make it bring forth bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. We understand that. Rain comes down. It doesn't go up. Okay, when it comes down, it causes seed to grow and uh, different plants to grow that will eventually bring food to people uh, in some ways, unless it's a weed. Okay, weeds, obviously not. We just cut them down, get rid of them. But uh, the, the, we understand that the process of precipitation coming down causes growth in the soil and different areas around that allows mankind to survive in an area. This is why there's not very many big thriving cities in deserts, okay? I have been to some deserts that have had thriving cities, uh, but not very many, right? Because there's no water coming in there. It's very dry. So we understand that that, that makes sense. Precipitation causes growth, causes life uh, in the soil and different things for plants and for people to eat. The verse 11 says, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So don't, uh, don't underestimate the power of just a simple verse. Um, you know, I had, a, <laughs> I had a, a professor in Bible college. He told me that whenever he's knocking on a door, he always tries to get a verse in the door before he le leaves. And so he's had times where people were slamming the door and he's like, you know, he quotes, prepare to meet thy God, you know, and stuff like that. You know, maybe he had the police called on him. I don't know. But uh, uh, the fact is, whatever we can do to get the word of God out there, you know, for some, it's, you know, it's a track. It has scripture and it. it's got pictures in it trying to share the word because that is what will make the difference is the word of god that is what will cause the conviction in their heart that they need to be saved uh, the holy spirit will use god's word like a seed uh, you just go out and spread the seed the holy spirit will plant and water it and and cause growth and that person might get saved so um give them the gospel give them the word of god that's what they need okay Number two, when we're talking to a, a Catholic, we want to give them the gospel. We want to share the word of God wherever we can. But this is another important thing. As you're sharing the gospel, focus on eternal security. This is, this is huge. Uh, I know being down, uh, going down and visiting uh, Brother um, uh, down in El Salvador, our missionary, Brother Serna, down there, um, one of the things he does when he's witnessing uh, is he, he hits hard on eternal security because it's a majority Catholic group that he talks to. Uh, he talks to many Catholics um, that are ingrained in that belief, in that system uh, of doctrine. And so uh, focus on eternal security. Understand that they do not believe they can know they are on their way to heaven. For them, that is presumptuous to believe that you can know for sure you're on your way to heaven. To us, we understand it's what the scriptures teach. It's what the scriptures say. These things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. Um, so put yourself in their shoes. They are trying to work for something that they are not ever guaranteed they are ever going to get. They're, they're trying to be good enough. They're trying to do all the things that the pope and, er and the priests are telling them to do but they're never going to really achieve it. They, they don't really know for sure. 
This is, you know, where you get the idea of, you know, St. Peter's Gate, you know, right? They're, that he's there guarding the gate, and he's, when people get up there, he's going to decide who's in and who's out. Okay, truth is, if you get up there, you're in, okay? <laughs> there's, no, there's no, like, okay, am I going to go in and buy that good enough or anything like that? That's not the way this works, okay? The reality is many of them are steeped in this, and, and they have no eternal security. Their, their salvation, so to speak, is conditional, based on the way they live their life. Um, uh, they, they don't know for sure that they're on their way to heaven. Um, doing some study, and there's some different sites. One of them is called Catholic Answers. It's nice to be able to look up some different things, some questions. To the question, how does one get to heaven? Catholic Answers puts this. To come to God and be saved, you need to repent, have faith, and be baptized. If you commit mortal sin... You need to repent, have faith, and go to confession. Okay, so, of course, they add baptism to salvation. Uh, they uh, also add this tidbit that if you commit mortal sin, you need to repent, have faith, and then you need to go to confession. So that means they go and confess it to the priest. We talked about it last week, the confessional, the reconciliation sacrament there. Um, so this is, this is their way of getting to heaven. So this begs the question, what are mortal sins? In, in a Catholic belief, what are mortal sins? Well, I looked that up as well. And uh, according to Catholic Answers, the lists of mortal sins are found in these following passages. So hopefully you have your Bible because we're going to look them up, okay? The lists of mortal sins are found in these passages. I have, uh, looking through these passages, I put in your notes about 30 blanks, okay? Uh, and we're going to go through these. Uh, these are what a Catholic, uh, according to what they, they believe, would be mortal sins. These would be sins that if, if you do not get taken care of in confession, you will not go to heaven. In fact, you'll go to hell. Okay? Um, so these are mortal sins. Okay? So let's look at, uh, first, let's start with Matthew 15. Matthew 15. And we're going to read through and see if we can grab a few of these out of here as we're looking at Matthew 15. Verse 18, Matthew 15, verse 18, if you have your Bible, you can flip there and we'll look together at some of these. Matthew 15, verse 18, the Bible says this, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies, these are the things which defile man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. So we understand that what that's saying is there's a few things there. First one is, is evil thoughts. Evil thoughts. Okay. How many of you would say uh, we've probably all had evil thoughts before, right? This, this is something you can't see, but only God can see. But we've all probably had evil thoughts. Maybe we thought something mean about someone, or we, we, we thought something evil in some way, and, and, and we thought no one could see, but God could see. So we've all had evil thoughts. It continues on there. It says, uh, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murder. Murders is one of them, obviously, to commit a, a, a murder and kill someone in homicide or something like that is a, is a, um, is a uh, mortal sin. Then also adulteries, that's uh, being unfaithful in, your, in the confines of marriage, okay, adulteries or adultery. Then there's also fornication, out of the hearts, out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, Fornications. This would be um, sexual sin outside of marriage. It's not just in marriage. Adultery is in marriage. Cheating on a wife or something like that. Fornication is prior to marriage or something uh, sexual done in that way. So there's fornications as well. There is stealing or thefts is what it said. There's false witness and blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashing hands defileth not a man. So seven mortal sins right there. Evil thoughts, murder, adultery, fornication, stealing, false witness, blasphemy. Blasphemy like taking the Lord's name in vain and, and uh, uh, using, him in his, in, uh, using his name in a way that is not honoring to his name. Okay, There's seven of them. Mortal sins. Okay, 
Um, let's go on to the next passage, Revelation 21. Revelation 21. If you have your Bible, you can flip back there. Revelation is the last book in the Bible, so it shouldn't be too difficult to find. Revelation 21, verse number 8. Okay, Revelation 21, verse number 8. <clears throat> the Bible says this, it says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Okay, uh, this one's pretty intense. It says, fearful. To be fearful can be a mortal sin, okay? Now, we understand God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, of sound, of, uh, of a sound mind and those things. But uh, it's, it, understand that we are not supposed to be fearful as Christians. We are supposed to trust in the Lord with all our heart, lean not to our understandings. Now, in a Catholic mindset, to be fearful is a mortal sin. To be in a state of unbelief is a mortal sin. To not believe what God says, or perhaps to not believe maybe what the Pope says or what the priest says, would be a mortal sin. Uh, abominable, the, the abominable would be anything abominable, unclean, things like that would be a good way, or hateful things. Um, as we go on in verse 8 there, it also talks about uh, murderers, that would be murder. Whoremongers um, is really... It, it, it comes from a Greek word, pornos. It, it's any sexual act outside of uh, marriage. Um, it's where we get the name or the word pornography. Um, so we would just say sexual acts outside of marriage is what we would put it. Uh, when we get into sorcerers, it's an interesting thing. When you look at sorcerers, it comes from a Greek word that means uh, narcotics, essentially. So we'd say drugs. Using some sort of drug that is uh, is... Um, causing you to um, lose your uh, ability to think straight and, and, and trust in Christ. And I understand medical things happen and people have to take things. I understand that. But we understand that there are certain drugs that aren't going to help us, they're going to hurt us. And here in a Catholic mindset, if you're going to follow this by the, by the word, uh, if you take drugs, uh, it's a mortal sin. Uh, there's also idolaters. Those would be people who put things above God. Um, for us in the 21st century, maybe we don't have a whole lot of idols in America, like little statues sitting around. Uh, but we, we have idols that we keep in our pocket all the time. You know, the cell phone can keep us from God. The Internet can keep us from God. The television can keep us from God, and that can become an idol. But idolatry would be one. Um, as well, lying, uh, kind of same, same thing as false witnessing. False witnessing would be obviously making up something about someone else, lying, just outright not telling the truth. Um, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Okay, flip over a couple pages to Revelation 22, verse 15. We'll get some more um, speaking about end times here, uh, about more mortal sins that one can commit. For without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So, of course, there we see some of those other mortal sins. Uh, look at Ephesians chapter 5. If you have the chance, Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 3 through 7 gives us some more lists of mortal sins. That someone can commit that would cause them to need to go to confession. Otherwise, they're in danger of going to hell. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 3 says, But fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness. There's the next one. Being covetful, covetousness, desiring things that others have, getting jealous about things that others have, and not being content. It's the opposite of contentment. It's covetousness. Um, and I think we can all struggle with that at times <clears throat> um, as we go on. Uh, but fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be once named amongst you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness, um, we, we'd call it obscenity or obscene gestures or behaviors that are inappropriate. Uh, filthiness is what the Bible calls it. Um, and, and we can go on here. 
Uh, it says, uh, neither filthiness nor foolish talking, foolish speech, things that uh, said at, at a time that shouldn't be said, okay? Um, how many of you, we've all said things, you know, at the wrong time, said things we shouldn't have said. I know there was one time in my life, I, f I feel terrible about it, but I was a teenager and our, our dog was uh, passing away and uh, I just didn't understand why everybody was sad. I was like, it's a dog, guys, who cares, you know? And, and I said those words out loud and everybody just looked at me like, why would you say that? And then my mom came around me later and she's like, you know, that was really hurtful. And I, did, I just didn't understand that, like, they had a bond with the dog that I didn't really have. And, and so we understand saying something in the wrong time. So foolish speech, even uh, as it goes on, um, uh, jesting, which would be like crude jokes, things that you know uh, are, are really hurtful, really mean, joking about someone behind their back in a way that would hurt them. If they were there in front of you, you'd never say that about them. That can be uh, uh, there, the jesting. Um, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Verse 5, For this you know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, uh, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Colossians 3 is going to give us some more of these. Um, as you can flip over just a few pages to Colossians 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 5 through 6. Speaking about um, dealing with our sinful passions and, 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 our, uh, and our flesh. It says to mortify. That means to kill, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. We get a few of those. Evil passions is one of them. Uh, lust, another. And um, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and... Uh, covetousness, which is idolatry. Of course, we see those as well. And then let's flip over to Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, speaking of the works of the flesh. It says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, um, idolatry, witchcraft is another one there, hatred, hating someone, variance or emulations. Uh, we call it zeal for things that are uh, not proper. You know, maybe they're, they get real stirred up about football and all those things, but they don't care about anything of Christ. They get all stirred up about making money, but they don't care about the Lord or Scripture. Um, zeal in the wrong wrong area is that emulations emulations literally means to to heat up okay they get stirred up about things um and uh, as it goes on wrath uh strife seditions we got anger contention seditions heresies envyings murderers uh drunkenness revelings and such of like of which i tell you before um, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So we see divisions and heresies uh, and then envy and then even intoxication and then uh, revelings there kind of means sort of rioting, just outright crazy rebellion uh, against whatever it might be, the government or something like that. So rioting. Okay. All right. That's a lot. <laughs> okay. That's a, that's a lot of stuff uh, to talk about. Okay. But, but understand this, okay, if a Catholic commits any of these, which they probably commit many of them every single day, now maybe not all of them, maybe they'll never commit all of them, okay, but they commit probably many of these, such as evil thoughts, envy, um, or being covetousness, maybe uh, having the wrong passions, about things being uh, to have uh, a zeal for things that are inappropriate or not honoring to God. Those, those things, uh, they, they, um, many people commit those things. And so for them, these are mortal sins. Now, why is this so important? Because if they commit a mortal sin, they have to go to a priest and they have to go and confess all of their mortal sins. Every one of them. It's like they have to remember every single evil thought they did, every single thing they did, every single bad thing they've done over since the last time they confessed. 
to get indulgences to lessen the penalty in purgatory and to potentially have their sins forgiven and taken away. Okay. Um, and, and what I want to say is mortal sins are basically any sin you commit. Okay. For, for a Catholic, it's basically any bad thing they do. Okay. There are some sins that are considered not as serious. that are not sins of commission. They're like sins of omission to them. Um, I think they're called uh, venial. Is that right? Is that what you said? Venial. Yeah, venial sins is what they're called. So um, those are not as serious to them. But again, these sins of commission, they're, they're sins that the individual knew it was wrong and they did it anyways. Okay. Um, basically any sin you commit. I mean, really, you know it's wrong. And so uh, for a Catholic, if they commit these, um, according to that same website, it says this, according to St. Paul, no matter how born again, how quote unquote saved or whatever you think you are, if you commit these sins and you do not repent, you will not go to heaven. This is the essence of what mortal sin means. So think back. No eternal security. They don't know that if the sin they committed this morning is what's going to keep them from heaven. They don't know that what they did a couple weeks ago. I mean, how many of us can even remember what we were doing three weeks ago? We probably can't remember what we had for breakfast four or five weeks ago, right? But yet, if they don't repent of every single mortal sin they committed, since the last time they confessed, they're in danger of not going to heaven at all. Uh, potentially spending a very long time in purgatory or even going, uh, going to hell. And so, again, understand that there is no eternal security in, in this belief system. So here you are. You're with a Catholic. You're talking to them about the Lord. Bring it back to eternal security. Bring it back to do you know for sure you're on your way to heaven? And I love this. The very verse they quoted uh, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and we didn't look it up, but it says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. But verse 11 says, And such were some of you, but ye are washed. But you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. The very thing that they quote as being mortal sins that can only be forgiven by a priest, the very next verse says, hey, you used to be that, but if you've been washed in the blood of Jesus, if you've been sanctified, if you've been justified, you're not that anymore. By the Spirit of God. And and that's a that's a powerful statement. So when we talk about uh, when we talk about Catholicism. Um, the evil, evil thoughts and these sins of uh, commission uh, are a big thing. Uh, another big thing that is happening is um, uh, many of the Catholics in the U.S. are going, are going woke, sort of. They're going to the left. I, I brought out some stats for you uh, in your notes. Uh, in the U.S., 65% of Catholics do not see cohabitation without marriage as a sin. Okay, Something the church would outright... Like, say, that's, that's sinful to be living together, a man and a woman to be living together without being married is living in adultery. That's what we'd say it is. But 65% of Catholics do not, in, in the U.S. do not see it as sin. Um, so essentially two-thirds of Catholicism doesn't, in the U.S. does not view that as sin. 50% of U.S. Catholics do not believe that homosexual behavior is a sin. Um, in 2019, there was a Pew Research study that found 61% of U.S. Catholics actually support same-sex marriage. So um, the very things that they're supporting, many of them are supporting, and, and you know, some of them are softening their stance on even abortion and things like that. Understand that if they even commit those things, or to even believe these things, to believe that homosexuality is okay, to believe that it's not a sin, is unbelief. Right? I mean, that's, that's a mortal sin in itself. And so there are many people that are lost in this, and they're lost in this belief system that there's no hope, there is, there's no eternal security, there's no chance they're going to get past this, um, and it, it is a hopeless situation. 
And so for us, when we, when we have an opportunity to witness to them, let me give you some, some questions to really kind of stir, stir up um, the eternal security topic, okay? Let's say you are talking to a Catholic. I, I say this just about to anybody, but one of the big questions uh, to ask is, are you 100% sure that you're on your way to heaven? Okay? If they say yes, then you say, okay, what gives you that assurance? And if they say anything besides, I know Jesus as my Savior, or Jesus is my assurance, or something like that, if they say anything besides that, you already know that they're not trusting in Christ. Um, you know, for a Catholic, they may say yes, and then you may ask them, why do they have that assurance? And they may say, well, you know, I was baptized as a baby, or... or um, uh, I, I go to Mass however many times or, or things like that. I keep the sacraments if they're real devout. Um, but asking them that is, is a big question. Because it's not just, sometimes when we're witnessing to people, we ask them, we would say, do you know Jesus? And that's a good question to ask. You know, you're asking, do you know more than just about Jesus or maybe who he is? Do you know him personally as your Lord and Savior? If you ask a Catholic if they know Jesus, they're going to say, yeah, I know Jesus. Of course I know Jesus, right? They're, they're, that, is, that isn't a good question to ask them when it comes to salvation. It's, you want to ask them, are you 100% sure you're on your way to heaven? Um, another thing you might ask them, if, you, if, you, if you're bold enough, maybe you might ask them, do they have any con unconfessed sin? Is there any unconfessed sin in your life? If you're real bold, okay, it might be a real, real strong one, but um, maybe you could ask it in a big way. No, again, <clears throat> there's something about questions, okay? They're much better than accusations. If somebody's accusing, pointing your finger at them, you know, and you're like, you're on your way to hell, buddy, you know, or you're a, you've got unconfessed sin in your heart, you know, that's going to push them away, that's going to shut down the conversation, that's going to turn off any opportunity to witness to them, but a question can stimulate the conscience, really get them thinking. So you might ask them, are you 100% sure that you're on your way to heaven? You could ask them if they have any unconfessed sin. You could ask them when was their last confession, you know, if they say something like it's been a year, it's been few years or something like that. Um, obviously, you can stir up, you know, maybe has, has there been any sin that you've committed since then or something like that. Um, or another easy one uh, that helps, helps a lot of times when people don't, when they say, yeah, I'm not a sinner or I've never committed sin, they're thinking of the real bad stuff, you know. And they're like, well, I've never, you know, I didn't murder anybody. You know, I'm not as bad as Hitler, right, or something like that, murdering 6,000 Jews or 6 million Jews. But um, uh, an easy one is, is, is you know, ha have you lied? Ha have you lied? Because that, that's, that's a sin. And that's one that people will often do. Gentlemen, quiet over here, please. Okay. That's one that people often do um, and not even, well, don't, don't even bat an eye about it. So that's a good one. Another one you could ask is, have you missed Mass since your last confession? Because to miss Mass is a, is a sin uh, to not be where they're supposed to be. So... Um, so focus on eternal security. Try to get them thinking about that they do not have that assurance of salvation. Because once you help them to understand they don't have it, then you can help them to see that they can have it. Okay, and, which brings me to my last point. Okay, is there biblical evidence for in, an eternal security? Okay, is there biblical evidence for an eternal salvation? Uh, I think there's plenty of biblical evidence. Let me give you a few of them. Let's say you're witnessing to a Catholic. You get them to the point where they realize, okay, I don't have eternal security. I don't know for sure I'm on my way to heaven. And you tell them, well, I do. Let me give you some reasons why. Okay, let me give you some verses why. Now, obviously, there's the verse in 1 John uh, that is wonderful. 1 John chapter 5, I believe it is, that says, This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son, he that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. It also says in that same passage or same portion that these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So uh, those are important ones. You know that you have eternal life. That's what the Bible says. Starting with that verse is a good, good place to bring them to. Say, hey, the Bible says that we can know we have eternal life. But let me give you some uh, other things. When we're talking about eternal security, what we're talking about is once you are saved, you are kept by God's power and can never be lost. That's what we're talking about, okay? 
when you're saved, you're saved for life. If you truly trust Christ, there's no losing salvation. Okay, that's, that's what we're talking about. That's eternal security. Um, the very, the very salvation is called, it's referred to as eternal life, right? Um, I don't know why we think it's, you know, like if I'm bad enough, then I'll lose eternal life. Eternal life is forever, okay? And when you receive Christ, you get eternal life. So I think we understand that. But eternal security, once we're saved, we're kept by God's power and can never be lost. So when we talk about uh, eternal security, we have to understand it is a threefold work of the Trinity. We see all three members of the Trinity, all three persons of the Trinity involved in eternal security. The first one is found in John chapter 10, verse 29. Jesus said these words. He says, my father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hands. So when talking about eternal security, we are kept in the Father's hands. He holds us tight. Uh, no one can pull us out of the Father's hand. Okay, there's a couple uh, things that the Holy Spirit does, or, or pictures of the Holy Spirit that the Scriptures talk about. Um, that uh, show eternal security, okay? Uh, the first one is known as the seal, okay? The seal of the Holy Spirit. It's found twice in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, if, you, if you have your Bible, you're welcome to turn there. I don't, or, I don't remember if I put it in your notes. If I did, great. If not, I'm sorry. You'll have to look it up later. But Ephesians chapter 1. And, uh, oh, I did put it in your notes. Perfect. Okay, so uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 13 uh, the Bible says this, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possessions unto the praise of his glory. And then Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Uh, years ago, when I was teaching at the school, I had this bright idea that uh, for, I think it was Pastor's 35th anniversary, that for his 35th anniversary, we as a class, the 5th and 6th graders and me and my wife, were going to take these papers, we were going to write letters, and we were going to make them look like parchment paper. So we did like the coffee staining and stuff and all sorts of cool things. We made them look real nice. I think we even kind of burned the edges a little bit without lighting a fire. Praise the Lord. I didn't let them do it. I did it. Okay, I was the adult of the room. Don't worry. Uh, but uh, we, we, we did all these fun things. And then we decided what we would do is we would fold it up. And I had a wax stamp. I don't know if you've ever seen them. But I had a, a wax stamping uh, kit that made like a big W on it. And I thought, oh, it's going to be so cool. We've got these old style letters. We'll fold them up and then we'll seal it with that wax stamp. So we took the wax and we burned it. And then we placed that big W seal on there that sealed the letter. Uh, all I think there was about 20 of them that we gave to Preacher. And uh, I was so excited. I was like, man, he's going to love those letters. That's just so cool. He came to me a week later and he said, how dare you give me all those stamps on those letters? He said, I had the hardest time trying to open those letters. <laughs> the papers kept ripping and stuff because the seal protected them. It was, it was, he, of course, he was being humorous, but uh, it, was, it was still pretty funny. But the idea is that a seal, uh, when it's placed on something, it's very hard to break. In fact, um, there's two things that a seal does. A seal, first, it protects. It protects the, uh, the letter from tampering. It's kind of like, you know, when you open a bottle of pills or something, there's a seal on it. It says sealed for your protection. That's because a long time ago, back in, I think, the 80s, there were some people who were putting, like, cyanide in Tylenol pills, right? And uh, a bunch of people died from it. It was crazy. It was, I think it's called the Tylenol murders or something like that. But uh, they started sealing things for protections to know that they haven't been tampered with. When, when a letter is sealed, it, it's not opened until it gets to its uh, intended recipient. If that seal is broken, you know it's been tampered with. So a seal protects until it arrives at its destination. The Holy Spirit keeps us secure in our salvation. It protects our salvation until the moment we meet Jesus, until the day of redemption. But not only does a seal protect, 
but a seal shows possession. It shows who sent the letter. Typically, kings or whatever would have a a significant seal that only they had to show that that letter came from them. Maybe they had a ring that they would seal it with or something like that. For us, it was just a big fancy W to show that it was from Mr. Watson's class. Um, But a seal shows, it, it gives protection and it shows possession. Understand that the Holy Spirit as our seal that we've been sealed by protects us, keeps us secure in our salvation, and it shows who we belong to. We belong to the Lord. Our bodies are not our own. It is the temple of God. So there's the picture of the Holy Spirit. So we're kept in the Father's hand. Then there's the picture of the Holy Spirit being the seal. But in the same passage, there's another picture of the Holy Spirit. And there's this one known as the earnest. The earnest. Now, when you think of the word earnest, maybe you think of Ernest, uh, the guy who used to get, like, you went to jail one time, you went to Africa one time, and made all those funny movies. None of you kids remember that. Google it when you get home. You'll figure out who Ernest is. But uh, I grew up watching uh, Ernest and his different adventures. But uh, when we talk about Ernest, uh, it's found in both of these portions. First, in Ephesians 1, 14, uh, speaking about the Holy Spirit, it says, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. In 1 Corinthians 5, 5, it says, Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who has also given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 1, 22 says, Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Now, what is an earnest? An earnest is sort of like a down payment. It's a, it's a, um, like a, a, a down payment that is given to show that there is more payment coming, okay? It's a pledge that's given sort of to secure a loan, okay? The Holy Spirit is our earnest. And it says our earnest of, the earnest of our inheritance, meaning he's given to us to show that there are more things coming. The promise of joy, the promise of eternal life in heaven is there because of our earnest, our our pledge that's been given to us. Webster defines earnest as first fruits, that which is in advance and gives promise of something to come. I read today in a commentary that in the same word for earnest in modern Greek means an engagement ring. And I got to thinking about that. Normally an engagement ring, if you really want, you know, if you really want to marry a girl, guys, okay, um, normally what you do, normally what you do is you do not go to the Fred Meyer quarter section and get a little ring out of there that, you know, might fit her pinky, okay? You want to get her a nice ring because it shows that you love her, that you'll take care of her, that um, how valuable she is to you by giving her a nice uh, engagement ring. Now, what does that have to do with this? The Holy Spirit, in a way that I don't think it's demeaning or anything to say, the Holy Spirit is like our engagement ring. He's been given to us now, right? The Bible says that we, as the bridegroom or the the groom of Christ or the the bride of Christ excuse me the bride of Christ we've been betrothed we're we're on our way to heaven there's going to come a day when there's the marriage supper of the lamb where the 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 bride of Christ will be given to the bridegroom Jesus himself and so there's a wedding coming there's a marriage supper that's coming And you and I have been given the earnest of our inheritance, the engagement ring, so to speak, to show that in Christ we are incredibly valuable to him, to show that he can take care of us, and soon we will be married to him for all eternity. Say, why are these things so important? Because the Holy Spirit, he seals us. He is our earnest. And we're kept in the Father's hand. The Holy Spirit pictures it in these two different ways. But then not only that, when we think about Christ, we are not separated from Christ's love. According to Romans chapter 8, when it talks about the love of Christ, how much he loves us, it says nothing can separate us. Listen to what it says, Romans 8, 35 through 39. 
Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all thy day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Okay? So it is a, 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 an, an act of the Trinity that we're kept in the Father's hand. The Holy Spirit pictures it by being given to us. And that we're not separated. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Let me give you a couple other texts that might be helpful, talking about eternal security. John 1.12 calls us, uh, it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I like to illustrate it by saying that a son is always your son no matter what they do. Okay? Uh, my son, he could curse me to my face, he could shake his fist at me, he could do the whole prodigal son thing and run off into the far country, but he's still my son. You know, No matter how much that relationship is strained, he's always my son. And that's the way it is with God the Father. Um, that when you're a part of his family, when you've been adopted into the family of God, you become a son by believing and receiving Jesus, um, and uh, once a son, always a son. So that's, that's an important text. Um, 2 Timothy 1.12 says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I believe it, and persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Now, we may know that verse because of that famous song that say, that's entitled that, for I know whom I believe it. But when you think about that, it says, He is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. What have you committed? You've committed your life to him. You've, you've given him everything. You've trusted in him. You've put your faith in him. And he is able to keep it Amen. until that day, against that day. So understand that there's some solid verses speaking about eternal security. There's one more verse I'll share with you. It says in second, uh, actually two more verses, sorry. Second Timothy 2, it says, It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Um, even if you're struggling with unbelief, uh, he's still faithful, and he can't deny himself. Uh, powerful verse there. John 5, Jesus said this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Jesus made this promise that if you hear him and believe on him, you have eternal life. Um, and you will not come into condemnation. Okay, Jesus isn't going to take back his word. He's not going to give you the gift of salvation. Take it back. It's not a gift anyways, if that's the case. It's a, it's a wage. Um, and so understand there's solid Bible verses about the promise of eternal life. And um, you just might be able to win a Catholic friend to Christ by focusing on the fact that they don't have eternal security, but they can have eternal security in Christ. And so I hope that maybe some of these things have been a help. I know we've studied different religions. The greatest thing, remember, is we've been given the gospel. It's the, the hope that is within us, um, the, the answer that the world needs, and um, no amount of studying other world religions is going to make a difference. What's going to make the difference is Jesus and sharing him with others, and I hope that as we've studied these things, maybe you've thought of some ways that you can share Christ with these different groups, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses. And Catholics. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you've done. Lord, thank you for your power. Thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray you'd bless us as we go in just a moment. Would you be honored, glorified, and lifted up? If there's one person who doesn't know you as their Savior, help them to trust in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.